Welcome to the Power of Culture. I'm Al Mayasa bint Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani. My nation, Qatar, is on a creative journey supporting the talents of a rising generation, reaching out to other countries through the arts and building an entire cultural infrastructure. In each episode of The Power of Culture, I'm joined by a leading artist or architect, philanthropist or museum professional who is part of Qatar's journey. Listen in as we discuss what the power of culture can do. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by the Pritzker Prize winning architect, Rem Koolhaas of the firm OMA. Hi, Rem. How are you? Hi. Uh, very well. And, and uh, kind of very keen to, to do this interview. Thank you so much for your time. I have always been so fascinated by the trajectory of your life, the many experiences and careers that you have led. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? Well, I think uh, I was kind of really lucky. My generation was lucky, even in terms of uh, bad luck, because I was born in the war, uh, and therefore my kind of first memories are about just after the war. There was a kind of euphoria about uh, liberation, but there was also kind of genuine poverty. And uh, particularly the fact that I experienced poverty, I think is kind of very crucial in terms of my overall experience and sensibility. Then I was lucky that my parents took me to Indonesia uh, abruptly when I was eight. And in Indonesia, we were also in a euphoric situation because Indonesia had been just liberated from the Dutch. And that meant that I was in a post-colonial situation and had to behave in a post-colonial manner. I was, for instance, the only European Boy Scout in a group of 80 Indonesian Boy Scouts. So it, it really learned me to be a minority and what it meant to be a minority. And then later, I was kind of really lucky that um, in, I was grew up in the 60s. And in the 60s, people were not kind of really interested in formal education or university degrees. And they were actually encouraging you to pursue what you wanted. And that meant that when I was 18, I could be a journalist and even a kind of filmmaker. So basically, uh, my life, you could say, because of all those conditions, was not highly organized, but, but gave me uh, enormous freedoms and, and a wide range of experiences uh, before I actually choose what I ultimately wanted to do. Would you say those kind of childhood exposures and feeling like a minority and experiences shaped the character that you have today and the ways that you think about your current profession? It totally shaped my character and... I think it makes me extremely keen to encounter different uh, cultures. And so uh, many architects work in, in different backgrounds and globalization enables us access to many places. But in almost every one of those places, I've tried to really do more than simply leave a building and, and be more engaged in a deeper sense uh, with those uh, environments and cultures. And, and Qatar is a good example. So you mentioned that Qatar is a good example, but before we get to your, your first visit to Qatar, how did you end up deciding to become an architect? Like what was the trigger or the experience that made you decide? The trigger, the trigger was really when I was uh, 23, um, a group of architects asked me to give a lecture about film. And so I prepared the lecture and when I gave the lecture, I kind of realized that uh, every one of those architects uh, actually wanted to become a filmmaker. <laughs> and then uh, those architects took me to Russia in 1967, uh, Russia was then uh, kind of deeply Soviet uh, and deeply communist. And in Russia, uh, a particular kind of architecture had been developed uh, in the early part of the revolution, which was actually very close to script writing. The architects would really propose radically different ways of living. For instance, not in cities, but you could live in a countryside uh, in a small hut and have a collective kitchen 400 meters away in a forest. And so I realized that um, you could interpret architecture as a, a form of script writing. And then I decided to switch because I thought uh, architecture was kind of more, more interesting and more substantial. 
And so tell us about your first visit to Qatar. You've opened two iconic projects here, the National Library, as well as the Qatar Foundation headquarters, as well as you've entered many competitions of which some you've succeeded in, others you have not. Mm. But how did your first, I mean, why did you come to Qatar? initially and how has that I, I, came, I, I came to Qatar because we got a letter that uh, the Qatar government was interested in uh, a group of architects doing a group of buildings it was actually a kind of very long list and they asked uh, me which part I would be kind of interested in and I then uh, can respond that I was interested in a school for diplomacy because maybe above everything else I'm kind of really interested in politics and then uh, a while later, I got a letter. Uh, we are asking you to do a library and headquarters of Qatar Foundation. That then you know, became my mission. Uh, and those were two buildings that we got directly commissioned. And uh, I want to really make an argument for also commissioning buildings directly because it gives you a, a huge opportunity to not guess at people's intentions, but to actually capture people's intentions because there is a client uh, who tells you or could, can tell you what they need and how they see a particular project in terms. Uh, and then only then you start designing. And so I had the privilege uh, during Qatar Foundation headquarters to, to meet your mother and to, to, to capture her intentions and and her way of working and that you know, enabled me to to be quite precise in terms of those expectations uh, and the library was kind of slightly uh, kind of different uh, situation uh, but ultimately uh, it really benefited from the fact that uh, I had the experience of being in Qatar to understand Qatar better kind of before I actually started designing but let's let's before we go to the library because that's really an interesting evolution and a story in itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember when I was with Richard Serra driving from his East West West East installation, he told me that in his opinion you created the best contemporary architecture building f- from our heritage. He felt that the Qatar Foundation headquarters really resembled a modern souk. And you mentioned that that you were uh, you had the honor to be with my mother and understand her intentions for the headquarters. Mm. W- well, would you say that his uh, analysis is correct, or were there other intentions that you tried to um, express with your architectural work? Well, I think that uh, whenever you work in a particular um, context, you obviously extremely interested and and committed to try to do something that is kind of recognizable for the inhabitants uh, and and for and that falls within local experience and and local taste but of course you also want to uh, maintain your own intentions and your own uh, integrity and i think that uh, architects like uh, jean louvel uh, myself uh, and and pay, um, you can see in all our buildings in Qatar that on the one hand, uh, we are inspired by Qatar uh, and on the other hand, we, we also maintain our own position. And uh, I, I find that a very interesting uh, tension uh, between the two. And I think that I was lucky that the, the facade of the headquarters uh, which is kind of perforated by quite uh, small squares which is kind of multiplied in the interior by kind of reflections in the glass in the different angles of the glass actually creates a very decorative bubble or decorative enclosure which has to some of the same effects as islamic architecture even without at all being referring to islamic architecture so I think that's a partly conscious and partly unconscious process uh, where you try to to be appropriate. You know, I remember when we first had our the first conference, our Art for Tomorrow, we, we hosted the welcoming uh, dinner in the headquarters space. In between, you have that, um, how would you refer to it? That's a gap, uh, basically the gap. a gap. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, that gap. And... I was really impressed about not only the gap and the scale of it, but also the visibility it gives you 
of all of Education City campus, which consists of major institutions, but also architecture. Did you intend for that uh, to be perceived from that gap of the headquarters where obviously the vision of my mother has been realized within? Well, what you don't realize if you are in Qatar or don't maybe realize uh, in terms of uh, intensity is how poor in terms of uh, huge ambitions uh, Europe is uh, right now and how difficult it is to realize even modest ambitions in Europe. Um, and so when I first came to uh, Education City and first understood the intentions uh, of Isazaki's master plan, it was almost uh, with disbelief that I saw that so much of it had been executed uh, and so much of it had been built. And um, it, it really felt almost euphoric to be able to uh, work in such uh, a context uh, of so many ambitions realized in a very short time and with a tangible purpose also. And for that reason, uh, it, it was very natural to uh, want to use the building as a way in which you could uh, uh, see that literally with your own eyes. And so that takes us um, into a good transition with the National Library, which uh, is an amazing 21st century library that you have built at the center of Education City, mm. originally the central library for the universities. I mean, how did you create this concept with the facade and the interiors? Uh, what, what was interesting is uh, that I was instructed in the very beginning that the library had to stimulate reading. And there, there was basically an, uh, an instruction that perhaps not the entire Qatari population was used to uh, reading or to uh, committed to reading. And that therefore the building had to really uh, create uh, a very intense incentive to read. And uh, I combined that, with, when I thought about it, then I thought that in the typical library, there's a lot of things that are uh, not particularly stimulating or not particularly attractive. There is uh, compartments, there is a kind of very complex uh, catalog. Uh, there are usually uh, a number of different stories. Usually uh, you are quite remote from the books uh, when you enter. So um, I, that basically kind of suggested to me that I should try to make a building where you enter without many preliminaries and that once you enter, you are exposed to, to the entire richness of the books that surround you. So that made it uh, interesting to make a building where you enter in the middle. And once you enter it, you're surrounded by terraces of books that in one view gives you basically the whole reason for the library. It tells you how it works and it tells you how accessible the books are. And then there was an additional request that came out of the blue to also create a rare book department. And then... We were able, uh, as a major improvisation, to, to excavate it almost like archaeology. And, and so the net result is a combination of um, an, an almost random accident of that uh, request and, and my intentions to make something that stimulates reading. Well, I can tell you, you did a great job. And every time I visit the library, whether with my children or people, it's always full of, and buzzing with all sorts of people from students to faculty to visitors to musicians. So you really did a wonderful job. It, it's, it's also for me really exciting to visit, uh, kind of particularly because it, the public is so incredibly diverse. And that again, you know, is, is perhaps uh, not easy to realize when you live in Qatar because you're constantly confronted with uh, so many nations, so many backgrounds, so many um uh, Typologies of uh, human beings, but if you compare that even with the uh, Netherlands, it's kind of really re rich kind of social spectrum. Yeah, and so aside from these two projects, you've also curated several exhibitions in Doha with your partners. Um, you know, recently Virgil Abloh, you curated, uh, as well as the launch of the Qatar Auto Museum uh, with a installation at the National Museum's Mawater Gallery. 
I really find this um, concept of network of thinkers and collaborators as part of your architectural firm really unique. And how did you come up with this notion of a think tank? Well, in in a way, uh, you could say uh, out of uh, desperation. Let's say in the mid nineties, um, you had a kind of feeling that culture was uh, accelerating. There were enormous kind of movements. The the wall had just been uh, just disappeared. There was an optimism about uh, the world. Uh, internet was beginning to suggest uh, totally different uh, lifestyles and and ways of uh, behaving. So I felt that with our original training as architects and, and background as architects, it simply was not enough and that uh, we could not uh, be secure in terms of kind of resting with what we knew and that we basically had to find a way to constantly refresh and add to our own knowledge. And that basically became uh, a reason to th- think of the notion of a think tank. and. That was helped because Harvard uh, was willing to make me a professor. And my only condition was that I didn't have to teach design, but that I could basically be involved in research, uh, in research of general uh, issues, research, for instance, in the development of Africa, in the development of China, in uh, the effects of the economy on architecture neoliberalism on architecture. And so basically through this combination and our own think tank, uh, we were genuinely able to create a parallel reality for our office where in the office you focus on building, but uh, outside in this parallel world, we could focus on literally everything else. I like the idea of research. I think more and more people are recognizing the importance of museums that become our research centers by default. You know, you have to research the content and the narrative Mm -hmm. you're trying to present to the various audience. And I think transitioning into your next project here in Qatar, which is the Qatar Auto Museum, very much talks about research with, you know, looking at design, but also policy of cars in the future and energy, et cetera. You told me that to you in our, in our last encounter that this is a very exciting project. Could you tell us why you find this museum, which is really not a, it's a, it's a transformation of an existing building to another. Mm-hmm. Why is this so exciting for you? Well, the two things. I, th- I think that as part of uh, a genuine reorientation of um, uh, architecture and, and a more responsible behavior uh, of any architect really feels the pressure right now. Already, maybe for 10 years, we were interested in uh, finding ways in transforming architecture rather than building new architecture. Because transforming, if you can transform something, obviously, it, it is by definition more sustainable. The Prada Foundation is, for instance, largely a kind of renovation of an existing uh, industrial complex. So in, in principle, that interests me, but um, I'm also genuinely excited because I love cars uh, and um, I love driving. And I've had a whole uh, series of different cars and I find cars maybe the most eloquent uh, representatives of particular civilizations or particular moments in civilization. Because, for instance, you know, in the 70s, a French car was absolutely different from an Italian car, absolutely different from a German car. So cars are the embodiments in many ways of ideas. And uh, so it's really wonderful to be able to show them uh, and to be working on something dedicated to them. And then I realized that in in Qatar and in the Middle East in general, there's a very unique situation, a real fanaticism about cars that includes actually all the utilitarian cars like trucks and the cars that were necessary to even create the kind of cities that we know there. Uh, but that also many people uh, almost designed their own cars or specified their own cars. So there's kind of unique cross between military and SUV vehicles by Lamborghini that could be dropped by a helicopter from the sky and survive a drop of 10 meters. The whole Middle East and Qatar are full of 
exceptional stories related to cars. And next year, we're in 2023, in the fall, we're going to be curating a larger exhibition on the car museum in the building itself. I think your concept there of reusing plastic uh, as part of the initiative is quite interesting with the whole world thinking about sustainability. Why did you think about this idea specifically for our cars exhibition next year? Well, I, th I think sometimes we do uh, things that are much lighter than architecture. Uh, I, I love designing exhibitions, uh, but I also love designing, for instance, uh, fashion shows because fashion shows uh, are ephemeral. They can have a big impact, uh, but the impact is gone uh, uh, quite quickly. And you have to develop uh, different means than concrete and so we have been constantly looking and circulating how you can actually create an impact with minimal or cheaper means. And we looked with Samir and Samir discovered this uh, Spanish group that were able in an amazing way to create uh, bubbles of recycled plastic. And those inside those bubbles, you could then uh, uh, organize uh, any uh, spectacle. And what is interesting particularly is that they create these bubbles using existing buildings as a mold. So they push against the borders of the existing building and, and then take also kind of some of the shapes. So I think it's an experience that is both effective, fast, uh, colorful, uh, sustainable, uh, but also visually extremely uh, rewarding and rich and surprising. Uh, next, uh, it's interesting that uh, you talk about fashion because fashion has become a key component for our Creative Economy Awards. And next fall, uh, you're also going to be opening an exhibition countryside in our future vocational school that will include fashion. Um, it will be during the Agrite Expo in 2023. Um, how will this exhibition be different to the one you hosted or the one you curated at the Guggenheim in New York a few years ago? Uh, in, in, in the Guggenheim, we opened in 2020, and it was a moment that uh, basically one believed and the UN statistics were uh, confirming that the countryside uh, was globally uh, over across the entire world that people from the countryside were moving in enormous numbers uh, to the cities and that there was a risk that the countryside uh, in in a couple of decades would be almost uh, empty uh, and and in fact there are parts of japan for instance uh, at this moment that that are and have to be almost officially abandoned so that was the way we looked at the countryside and we looked um, in across every continent and tried to kind of find very uh, strong illustrations of the condition of the countryside. Uh, so sometimes pessimistic, uh, but sometimes also optimistic. Uh, in Africa, there's a real revival of the countryside that is uh, triggered, for instance, by mobile phones and startups that look at uh, agriculture. So what we hope to do in Qatar is different uh, and it's different for various reasons. It's partly different because the mood about the countryside has completely uh, flipped, you know, and it's partly through COVID. Uh, but now we're in a condition that actually uh, people from the cities are moving to the countryside again. So, which is in itself a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, many more people take the countryside seriously. And what we want to look at, therefore, is um, more serious issues of, of uh, food production and their global distribution. We want to benefit from the location of Qatar and look uh, at the same time uh, and closely at Africa, uh, not at the, as a Zoom, but as Africa as a whole, at Europe, at the Middle East, and, and see what each of those uh, parts has to offer to the others. And we want to also uh, look, for instance, at uh, the production of rice and how the, the nature of changing production methods uh, also affect landscape and, and, and the entire look of large uh, continents. So essentially, the difference is that the countryside has now a different kind of priority. 
and that we take Qatar as a center and, and, and begin to look from there. So it is heavy in research, similarly to um, the Qatar blueprint, which we've been working on now for yeah. almost a year, um, that not that connects Qatar's urban landscape with its natural habitat and the people, the wider vision mm-hmm. of the Qatar vision 2030 and beyond. Why do you think this is unique and important for a country the size of Qatar to be thinking in those ways? Well, I'm I'm interested, of course, in in big countries, but also interested in uh, small countries. Uh, basically, coming from Holland, I've been fascinated by Switzerland and and how it maintains uh, a kind of uniqueness uh, by Singapore and uh, also by Qatar, because I I would say that the scale, the small scale of uh, a particular piece of territory, basically enables you to uh, have a comprehensive idea in terms of what direction uh, it could move or it could develop and to have a comprehensive idea how the different uh, components could potentially relate to each other. Uh, so it, it's really the idea that uh, at a small scale, you can paradoxically have larger and more coherent ambitions than you can have for a huge country that is simply uh, beyond the reach of a single ambition. And for people visiting Qatar, what do you think, in your opinion, someone who visits us frequently, what's the most unique experience they can expect in Qatar? If I take myself, I was really struck by the unique tone of urban life there. It's quiet in a certain way. There is a kind of serenity and a kind of dignity um, uh, uh, and, and not too strong presence of commercial uh, elements. Uh, but what I also have begun to deeply appreciate is how beautiful the landscape is and and, and how in the landscape there is a number of uh, really unique uh, features uh, that, again, are, have the virtue of being accessible rather than being very remote. And I actually like uh, both the humor and uh, kindness of uh, and the intelligence of uh, Qatari. And I'm not saying it to flatter Qatar, but our experience in terms of being able to communicate at the level of almost uh, shortcuts and, and, and not very elaborate uh, arguments, but uh, mutual intuition and, and very direct communication has been uh, remarkable. Thank you, Rem, so much for this conversation and your time. I really look forward to announcing the special architectural tours you'll be leading during our Qatar Creates program in the fall, as well as the details of the exhibitions you're planning next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really fun.